Okay, thank you. So, um, as Neil has explained, um, we we're talking about two missions, two European Space Agency missions that were launched last year. And we're looking at um, photons of light that have wavelengths of about a millimetre. So that's the kind of size uh, of light we're looking at. Um, this picture of the Ariane rocket Neil was uh, talking about, and uh, his instrument here, Herschel, is at the top, and along with it was launched a second instrument called the Planck satellite. And again, in Maynooth, they've had an interest in the Planck satellite over many years, to Andy Murphy and Tully Peacock, another staff member, and Daniel Wilson, who was helping here, did his PhD in this. Emily Gleason in the second row designed these for her PhD. So we've had a, a lot of um, work on this over the last few years. And Planck was launched last year with Herschel, and it's just publishing its first year's data uh, now. So some very exciting results coming from Planck. Um, it has to go, as Neil explained, to L2, the second Lagrange point, 1.5 million kilometres away from the Earth. So um, stars that are 6,000 degrees emit an optical light, and we can see them. Um, you, me, uh, the table, telescopes emit an infrared, so the night vision goggles, we see them. Um, things are a little bit cooler emit at the wavelength we're looking at. So we have to make sure our telescope is extremely cold, and that's why we move um, very far away from uh, the Earth. Now, as well as seeing the things you talked about, the kind of molecular clouds, things where stars are forming and, and young galaxies, there's another reason why we want to look at radiation that has uh, a wavelength of about a millimetre. In fact, most of the photons, most of the light emitted in the universe since the Big Bang are emitted with wavelengths of this size. So photons have that kind of uh, wavelength. And um, it comes from very early universe. So again, like Neil's satellite, Planck is looking here between optical and between radio. And it turns out that that's what the wavelength that most photons in the universe actually um, have. And this is why we're interested in it. So as, as astronomers or cosmologists, we can kind of time travel because we know it takes light a certain length of time um, to travel. So it doesn't travel instantaneously. The sun is eight light minutes away. So we see the sun, if we look at the sun now, we see it as it was um, eight minutes ago. The nearest star is four light years away, so we look at the star, we're seeing it as it was four years ago. So we automatically, by looking further and further away, we look further and further back in time. And now our telescopes are very good and we can look extremely far away. So we can look past all the stuff that's near us, past all the normal galaxies, past all very, very young galaxies, and we can keep looking back. Eventually we hit a wall. And we hit a wall um, almost 14 billion years ago. The Big Bang happened about 14 billion years ago. We see this kind of wall in front of it about 380,000 uh, years, um, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. It's actually a relatively small length of time after the Big Bang. And we can see that if we look past all the stuff nearby and keep looking further and further away, we can see right back almost 14 billion years ago. And when we do that, what we see is a wall of radiation. I just have one slide here to try and explain why that's happening. So as the universe is, get, is expanding all the time. So after the Big Bang, the universe started expanding. And when things expand, they cool down. So the universe started off being very hot. It's getting cooler and cooler and, and cooler. And so at the start, it was too hot to have um, normal atoms. So the first atoms that would have formed were something like hydrogen, very simple, protons and electrons. But when it was very young, the universe was too hot for that to happen. So we had protons and electrons, they were separated. And what happens when you have electrons that aren't bound up in atoms is that light scatters off them very easily. So we often say the universe was foggy then. So photons would travel, but they wouldn't travel very far before they'd hit an electron and become scattered. So you really can't see anything very early on in the universe. It's not your telescope's fault. It's just the fact of this, this fog. These electrons are scattering photons all over the place. But the universe kept cooling as it expanded, and relatively quickly it cooled enough for hydrogen to form. So suddenly the protons and the electrons became bound up in neutral atoms. And the thing about what happens when that occurs is that these aren't very good at scattering light, at scattering photons. So from then on, the photons just travel in straight lines. Okay, so for the next, the next approximately 14 billion years, a photon moves in a straight line until we put a telescope in a way uh, and, and detect it. So when we look further and further and further away, what we actually see is this wall. And we're never going to get behind that wall with normal electromagnetic radiation, X-rays, microwaves, any sort. No matter how good your telescope is, you're only ever going to see this wall. We're going to have to do something a, a lot sort of clever in the future to try and see behind this. Maybe look at neutrinos or exotic particles or gravity waves, so um, space-time waves. But at the moment, this is the best we can do. And this is the closest we can get to the Big Bang. It's 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And this radiation that's come to us from this point 
has now cooled so its wavelength is one millimetre for terahertz radiation. And that's why we're so interested in it. It's called the cosmic microwave background radiation. So we used to use this designation of terahertz so much before, but they were called microwaves. So now the universe is cool. It's only three degrees above absolute zero. It's three Kelvin. Um, and this is what we're seeing when we look far, far away. We're looking at this wall very soon after the Big Bang. And we've designed the Planck telescope to look at that, to see if there's any information there. It's the best thing we can do in what's called observational cosmology and make real measurements very early on in the universe. This is what happens when we look at the microwave background, when we look at the sky and make measurements uh, at this wavelength, is you see something that's pretty featureless. Okay? So it's just about 3 Kelvin, just a little bit below 3 Kelvin, and pretty featureless. And that tells us that it's coming from the early universe, because if it came from something much closer by, we'd see the imprints of galaxies and things like that. You know, if it comes from a local star, we see the radiation coming from this direction. This is coming to us in pretty much the same form, the same temperature from all around, no matter where we look. And that's how we know it comes from the early universe. But if you look around us now, if you look around at the universe now, it's not perfectly smooth. So this is a nice picture of the, the uh, sky in infrared radiation. This is our own galaxy here along the middle. And the rest is stuff that's very, very far away. So the universe is kind of clumpy. It's got lumps in it. Uh, on average, it's kind of the same if you put a box here. The universe would look very much the same as if you put a box somewhere else. But there's definitely areas where there's a lot of stuff and there's areas where there's <coughs> gaps. And this is a nice picture from what's called the Hubble Deep Field. So the Hubble Space Telescope, the director gets discretionary time where he can look at anything he likes and he decided very clever to look at a blank piece of sky and you just stared at it for a long time and suddenly you can see that even though we think it's a blank piece of sky there's lots of galaxies and wonderful stuff there but the universe has got areas where there's not much and then suddenly you've got areas of a lot of gas and stars and um, we can look by as well and we see beautiful clumps of gas uh, around us that are making stars so the universe isn't smooth and um if it's not smooth now, it means it could never have been smooth. So that's how structure, that's how things are made, by gravity, starting on something that's slightly lumpy, and gravity magnifies it over time. So this is a computer simulation of things forming. But if the universe is perfectly smooth, um, it would stay perfectly smooth forever. So it's clearly not, because it's, it's not uh, smooth now. So as you go back in time, it should begin to look smoother and smoother and smoother, but never perfectly smooth. But the microwave background did look smooth when they looked at it first. So what, what we try to do by looking at the micro background is look even more carefully now to see can we see these fluctuations, these basically hot spots and cold spots. So it shouldn't be about three degrees everywhere because the universe couldn't have been smooth then. And whatever structure was there, galaxies forming for the first time, they should leave an imprint behind in the microwave background, which wasn't seen when the microwave background was first detected in 1965. So astronomers then decided to look more carefully. So this little movie here is just, well, first of all, it just shows why we see the galaxy. This is a picture of our galaxy, which on the side looks a bit like a fried egg. So when we make a map around us, we always get this galaxy um, in the centre. And when we look at maps of the universe, just like looking at an atlas, the, the globe, you kind of unwrap it so you can put it um, flat. So that's why we see this kind of galaxy always <coughs> along the middle. So that's the stuff we have to look through. And we can look at it, the universe in all different wavelengths, from the visible all the way up near infrared, and we see all different features. And then when eventually we get up to microwave regions, suddenly it starts to look really featureless until we ramp up the sensitivity. We start to see our own galaxy, and eventually we start seeing features behind it, these little fluctuations. This is what cosmologists are really into. This is just the galaxy. Astronomers like this, we get rid of it, and we look at um, the microwave background behind that to see pictures, a snapshot of the universe as it was when it was extremely young. So this is the first picture that was made in it. This is the early 90s, and that's the first time anybody had the sensitivity to be able to measure features in the microwave background. So that's the very early universe. Galaxies, stars didn't exist back then. There were just hot spots and cold spots where eventually things were starting to come together, and eventually as time goes on, they would grow into galaxies and stars. This is, uh, that was made by a NASA satellite called COBE. They improved their observations with another one called WMAP, and Planck, the next the satellite that Europe launched last year, will do even better than this. So you can start some really detailed features here. And cosmologists know how to look at that and tell things about the universe from looking at that picture. Because depending on what the universe is made from, that picture will look different. So the best picture we can make tells us an awful lot about um, the universe. Um, Planck has been going for about a year now, and it started to make some good scans. Maybe I'll just show um, quickly... <coughs> No, that's the last one. No, I won't do that. Um, Planck has been observing for about a year. It's made some nice maps of a lot of the stuff that's between us and the microwave background, so a bit like some of the things that Neil was showing, some lovely pictures of, of gas and dust. Of course, cosmologists, what we want to do, this is Planck's first picture, 
And um, we want this is all the galaxy along here and stuff that's between us and this very early early stuff. What we want to do is look away from that. And it's actually these fluctuations here, this kind of speculative bit that cosmologists are after. And this is this is the bit of the universe that we're looking through our galaxy and we're seeing it as the universe was 380,000 years after the Big Bang. So Planck is just beginning to publish its first results now. So the kind of thing we can tell about the universe from looking at those pictures, one of the interesting things is what the universe is made up out of. And the normal stuff that we're used to, you know, the atoms that make our, ourselves and the world around us, is only a small percentage of what the universe is actually made of, you know, about 4%. And the rest of it, another good chunk, about a quarter of it, is made up of what's called dark matter. That's just stuff we can't see, but we know it's there, because it has a gravitational effect. Some of it might be normal things, just like maybe Jupiter, something big but not very shiny. Um, but we do know from cosmology that a lot of it has to be more exotic than that. So it's, a, it's not just normal stuff that's dark, but, but unusual thing that's dark. And about 10 years ago, we started to realise that, you know, that looked bad enough, but it's even worse, and that almost three-quarters of the universe is made up of something we didn't even know existed 10 years ago, and that's called dark energy. And we really don't have a clue what that is. Um, the universe got a, bit of, got a kick from the Big Bang and started expanding hugely. The microwave background comes from this part here. This is just a diagram of what the size of the universe looks like as time goes on. So it expanded really quickly at the start, then we have this kind of normal expansion phase that we've been going through for most of the last 15, 14 billion years. The universe gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And now it's accelerating again. So everybody thought that the universe gets a kick from the Big Bang, but the stuff that's in the universe pulls it back because gravity pulls things towards itself. And that's what we expected. We didn't know how much it would be pulling it back or how quickly. Um, but it was a real surprise 10 years ago to find it's not only getting bigger, but it's accelerating. So something is having the opposite effect to gravity. It's been called dark energy, and we don't have a clue what it is. Particle physics have some idea, some idea, but it hasn't worked out so far. So most of the universe is made up out of something we didn't know existed 10 years ago, and we still don't have a clue what it is. So there's plenty of work to do in physics to discover those kind of things. We can do even better um, uh, with Planck than the American satellites did, and we're doing it from the ground now to try and test it out. And that's not just making a picture of the light that comes from the microwave background, but also it's polarisation. So this kind of stuff is polarised, the light has a certain direction. But those fluctuations that we saw that we had to ramp up the sensitivity for are only one part in a hundred thousandth of one degree, so they're tiny. And you have to make very careful measurements to be able to get rid of the galaxy and all the stuff in front of it. It turns out that the light is slightly polarised, but even at a smaller level, so about one part in a million. So it's only slightly polarised. But if we can see that polarisation, we can tell even more about the universe. And the best measurements that have been made so far about polarisation haven't come from the satellites, which made this very crude, even though the temperature map is good, the polarisation given by the lines here, it's not very high resolution. The best maps that have been made so far have been made by um, another experiment, which is based at the South Pole, that we've also been involved in, in Manute. So we do ground-based measurements and uh, space-based um, as well. So I leave it there then. Um, so I hope you guys, well, Neil and myself, talk, just give me a bit of an idea of some of the work we do in Maynooth and the reason why we do it. We've got one more speaker. Frank is going to tell us about another research group, and that's the Atmospheric Physics Group.